So joining us this morning is Emeritus Professor Des Gorman. Good morning to you, Des. Good morning, Michael. Um, I read your opinions very early on in the piece because you are a sort of a dissenting voice as to the policy options the government's chose when we first had COVID, and I read of you, and you were getting, I thought, good coverage, and then you disappeared. What happened? Uh, late last year, Michael, I, I was a wee bit unwell, actually, and so it was appropriate I stood back while I um, got better. But also, Michael, uh, I think I had said what I needed to say, and I was getting sick of saying the same thing over and again, and I was becoming tired of my own voice, and I figured that if I was becoming tired of it, then people, uh, the public must certainly be getting tired of me as well. So I decided it was an appropriate time to not uh, retreat, but just step away. Did you get any pressure at all to pull Oh, yes, head? absolutely. I, I was under a lot of pressure to not comment, and ironically, mainly from fellow academics who uh, I, you know, shame on them, basically abrogated the core responsibility of academics, which is to maintain our freedom to comment on what's happening in society. And uh, certainly academic colleagues put extreme pressure on me to stop talking. Why did they do that, do you think? What was their motivation? Uh, well, I mean, I'd have to assume it was largely political and a determination to support the government and its uh, management of COVID because when they were asked, when one of them wrote to the Herald uh, saying I didn't speak on behalf of the university, of course, it's an absurdity. No one can speak on behalf of the university. The university doesn't have an opinion. It has a collection of academics, all of whom have their own opinions. But when he wrote, he was asked to um, comment on what I'd said that he thought was materially wrong. And the only thing he could think of was that he, he disapproved of me saying the government was relying on dumb good luck. Um, yes. Well, at the time, I mean, I would have thought the argument they were relying on dumb good luck was self-evident. That was the article that most um, interested me. I read that out actually to our listeners last week. There's um, that, and I noted that the opposition that you got was was only on on that issue that they weren't having a go at the facts that you were uh, outlining. Mm. Can can you take us back now? Your primary criticism that you feel most vindicated about uh, now, what would you consider that to be? Look, from the get go, uh, Michael, I objected to the way in which uh, the whole management was subservient to managing political risk, not public health risk or economic risk or social risk. So from the very get-go, I took exception to the fact that the whole process was uh, to subservient to a political objective. Having said that, a lot of other countries did exactly the same thing. And a lot of other politicians in those countries reached short-term benefit from that, from that approach. But I think we sacrificed uh, public health, our economic well-being and so on uh, at the altar of uh, public ex of political expediency, and uh, I found that objectionable. And the other thing that wound me up, to be honest, was when I knew that both government and the Minister of Health were being not fully honest. Let's well, you know, let's be blunt, they were being dishonest. Uh, and again, I think uh, we ex we should expect as a society that people can trust us with the truth. Indeed. Um, what did you find? to be particularly dishonest of the Ministry of Health? What what sort of things? Well, during the very first uh, lockdown, uh, Michael, we've been told there was lots of influenza vaccine available. I knew there wasn't. Uh, we were being told that there was plenty of PPE. I knew there wasn't. <clears throat> we were told that nurses weren't doing split shifts. I knew they were, uh, and, and so on. I mean, it was just uh, misleading statement after misleading statement. Of course, it got worse after that. Uh, uh, in terms of some of the misinformation around why we were being vaccinated at such a slow rate and everyone's being tested before they leave MIQ and then we find out they weren't. Uh, the, the, you know, it was investigative journalists like Michael Morrow who basically peeled back layer after layer of disinformation, but he was only able to do that through official information requests. And so it was always after the event and the response always was, well, yes, but... That may be true, but we've learned from it and moved on. Whereas, in fact, if you look at the empiric evidence, for example, how well we were handling contact tracing, it's very clear we hadn't moved on at all. We, we, did, we showed no improvement whatsoever. 
Um, I guess you'd be supporting the calls of the four uh, other parties in Parliament, apart from Labour, for an independent inquiry into our COVID response to see if we got it right? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, the necessity for an inquiry is not just because there will be more pandemics, but this pandemic has a long way to run, mm-hmm. and it's important that we understand what uh, was effective and what wasn't effective. And certainly, I think that uh, inquiry is a good idea from that point of view. But I think also, as citizens, Michael, we need an inquiry to reflect on our own behaviour here. So I, I saw a side of New Zealanders which I found unpleasant, I mean, it's almost like the Lord of the Flies, given an, an appropriate fear, that is, there'll be tens of thousands of deaths, and uh, let's say that that was one of the most misleading comments from the very beginning. Uh, but, you know, given a confrontation where there's going to be tens of thousands of deaths, we rushed off to the supermarket, bought our body weight in uh, toilet paper, and headed back to our caves to wait out the flood. And it, the thing that worried me is that we surrendered our humanity in the process. We tolerated people being required to die alone, and we tolerated women being alone after they gave birth. And, I mean, that's what I meant by Lord of the Flies. We abandoned our humanity in response to an existential fear. Now, the fact that that fear was uh, grossly inflated from the get-go to achieve um, public compliance, I assume, uh, put that aside for a minute because I think that's egregious, but uh, I think we as a society have to reflect on the fact that uh, our behaviour was uh, an abrogation of our humanity and an abrogation of our social responsibility to each other. Totally agree with you. There's, um, and that's why when I read your... You see, your commentary I thought was very important. It's easy to dismiss people who do not have your level of education or background or medical knowledge as being somehow uh, deficient. Uh, when compared to government authorities. But I think when you stood out there, Des, um, I know I read you and took you very seriously indeed. And I wanted to hear more of that because I wanted to know what the options were. Um, It seemed at the end of the day that there was only one form of narrative and everything else was being suppressed to me. Did you get that view too? Oh, totally. I think um, we've got two fundamental protections against uh, anarchy in our country or uh, an autocracy in our country. One is the media, and I think uh, as a generalisation, uh, they became a fan club and yeah. a cheerleader squad. Yeah. And I think the other is academia, and yet we had more, I had more academic writing for me trying to suppress my point of view than uh, encouraging me to speak, regardless of whether they agreed with me or not. So I, I think uh, the pandemic represented a very significant threat to our democracy and we descended both, as I say, a level of uh, people and government to a form of behaviour which I think when we reflect back on it, we should be embarrassed. No, uh, listen, every, there's not a word that you say that isn't just the truth. Um, the and, and you're right, the, the bulwarks that we have against an oppressive state are an independent media and academia who we like to think... Um, is, is, is fearless, but I don't I don't understand why academia has fallen in behind. What's happened? It used to be when I was at university, and this goes back 40 years, Des, but I guess when you were studying as well, we always looked at academia as, as being an independent source of truth and of, at times, questioning knowledge. What's happened in the last 40 years? Look, it's a very good question. Uh, I mean, I'm as a started university in 1971, 1972, so you're right, there were very strong voices on behalf of uh, both the student body and also the faculty which were fearless, and you have to ask where have those fearless voices gone? I think in the case of um, academia, we have successively become more vanilla, we have successively felt the need to be careful about uh, the political correctness of what we say. I think uh, we have become increasingly subject to internal pressures to toe the line. We are increasingly worried about not upsetting government because of 
funding, and I think one of the things that I found particularly that were worrying about the COVID pandemic was supposedly independent commentators who were receiving $6 million from the government to do their modelling. Uh, if you have $6 million of government funding, you are not an independent commentator. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't provide commentary, but you should declare your conflict of interests. And I think finally, Michael, the, the public health community has always had a, a political left lean, but I think there's a huge difference between being politically left leaning as a public health community and then deciding that your job is to actively support the government to be re elected. That's not your job, actually. Uh, and it's, it's no academic's role to actually support or try to bring down a government. I think we have an obligation to provide free and frank and fearless advice or commentary. Mm, okay. Um, where to next for you? Uh, you've retired uh, from medical school. You're an emeritus <laughs> professor. Um, do you just shuffle off left or do you continue <laughs> to hold both academia and the government to account? Uh, good question. I still um, am clinically active, Michael. I see patients twice a week and that keeps me grounded. I think one of the differences between clinicians like me and the public health community is that I still see patients. I understand the day-to-day -day nature of healthcare. I mean, I've not fallen in love with a spreadsheet. So I think that keeps me grounded and I'm grateful for that. I do a lot of policy work offshore, uh, Michael. I've been active internationally for a long time. I'm involved in health reforms in different jurisdictions and advising different um, governments and companies. And <laughs> interestingly, uh, well, ironically, uh, I'm far busier offshore with that than I am onshore, which is, I think, something you hear from a lot of New Zealanders. Mm. Okay. Well, there's the very best of luck to you. I expect you to be a leading voice when there's... Uh, there's going to be an inquiry one day, um, and the mm. truth will come out, uh, whether it comes out in the next 12 months or whether it comes out in the next 24. But I think the point that you make, that this pandemic has a long way to run, do you mean that you're likely to see more variants of COVID and therefore more public um, health responses as a consequence? Absolutely right. I think um, we've got quite a way to run with this pandemic yet. And I think if you look at the frequency of pandemics in terms of SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS and so on, you'd be very naive not to accept that there's going to be more pandemics involving different sorts of virus or other infectious agents. So uh, us getting our collective act together, I think, is important. But as I said to you, Michael, I think there's far more fundamental things we need to address in this inquiry about our behaviour. Okay. No, so do I. Listen, this is a very important um, interview, Des, uh, for a number of reasons. I just want to wish you well, and I want to thank you also for your honesty and truth um, that you've spoken and for your continued intent um, to hold the authorities to account. I thank you for your courage. Thank you, Michael. Okay, you have a good day. Thank you very much. Um, listen, we'll try and put that interview up. The, Shane, uh, that interview, I won up on our show. I think it's absolutely critical. This is a emeritus professor, Des Gorman. He was the former head of the Auckland Medical School. Uh, he was one of the first people who said the Ministry of Health are saying bullshit. Now, he didn't quite say it in that line, and obviously I don't usually use that word, but that is what he said. And you'd have to say, and the examples that he has provided, he has without doubt um, made his point uh, extremely well. The two areas that he identified as who should have protected us and didn't were the mainstream media, um, whose job it is to question governments uh, and to demand. Uh, those um, media who finally did get there uh, were too late and drowned uh, by the cheerleading of the other um, mainstream authorities, I guess after they'd taken their $50 million worth of public interest journalism fund, um, and also academia. Uh, academia we have always looked at as being the repository of fearless truth of questioning knowledge, as I've called it, um, the idea that you come from a basis of fact and that you questioned whether or not that's true 
Um, they were failures in both those two areas during the pandemic. There's no question. But as Des Gorman also pointed out, this pandemic has a long way to run. Uh, we will put this interview up. It is a critical interview. This man is not some mad anti-vaxxer. This man is not somebody who's read all their information on the internet. This man is authoritative and as knowledgeable as you can possibly have. And he has called out those authorities, those academics, and those members of the media who have habitually lied, misled, or hid from us the truth.